Beautiful thing. Okay, let's talk about screenwriting. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, you co-authored the cinematography book that I was so crazy about. I'm crazy about this series. Uh, I mean, the just the, the the design of the books alone is just so gorgeous, and and your interviews are so fantastic. These conversations that you feature in this book. W- uh, did you jump at the opportunity to do screenwriting, uh, the screenwriting volume, or or was did it was pre- presented to you, or how did it work? Yeah, it was. I, you know, the and thank you. I mean, the cinematography book, like you were mentioning, I, I co-wrote that um, uh, with a editor uh, critic friend of mine named Mike Goodridge, who's based in London, who oversaw the entire film craft series. Um, each of these books is dedicated to a different craft in filmmaking. There's one on production design. There's one on costume design. There's one on editing. And when Mike and I finished the cinematography book. He said, you know, would you be interested in doing the screenwriting book on your own? And I said, you know, I would I would love to do that. And, you know, I, cinematography was something I was interested in uh, because it was a world I didn't know very much about. I loved movies, but what cinematographers do, I wasn't really aware. And so with that book, I thought, yes, I want to know what these people do. And so for me, that was sort of a fact-finding mission. With screenwriting, I think it's really interesting because I think – uh, I'm guilty of this. I think a lot of people are guilty of this. I think there's more of an impression of that we know what screenwriters do. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, the interesting um, sort of challenge about this book is what do I think I know about screenwriters and how much of that is actually true and what do they actually do? One of the things that I was very clear about um, with my editors for the screenwriting book is that I already knew that it was going to be different than the 10,000 of the screenwriting books out there, which, not to generalize grossly, but a lot of the screenwriting books are about how can I write a script in X amount of days and sell it for X amount of money. I mean, there's a, there's an industry out there for you know selling books for people who want to become screenwriters so that they can sell their, their hot spec ideas. Those books already exist, and they're out there in the world already. The thing that I love about the film craft series in general is that each chapter is devoted to one individual in that specific craft. And with screenwriting specifically, it is about them talking about themselves, um, their backgrounds, their upbringing, what got them interested in movies in the first place, how they approach what they do. It's very much not how to break into the business or what are the the tricks of the trade. We actually make that very clear to all of our interview subjects when we're doing these books that that's not our focus. The focus is giving the reader a sense of who the people are who do this specific craft. And so with screenwriting, what I was clear about with my editors was I wanted the book to cover as wide a gamut as possible of the different genres of movies. Because I think a lot of times when we think of a, if you want to interview screenwriters, we tend to think of the people who are Oscar nominees, Oscar winners, people who work in uh, dramas, um, what you may consider the more quote-unquote serious or um, important movies. And one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to talk to action writers, and I wanted to Mm -hmm. talk to comedy writers, and I wanted to talk to people both who work in Hollywood, but also work in different industries. You know, we have um, you know, Lee Chang Dong, the filmmaker uh, from Korea who did poetry in Secret Sunshine. He's one of the interview subjects. We have people from uh, Europe in the book, in Mexico. And I really wanted to have this kind of cross-section and not necessarily act as if one type of genre was superior to another type of genre. Um, because for me, the action writer that um, that I got for the book, uh, Mark Bombeck, who wrote um, uh, Unstoppable and Live Free or Die Hard, um, I think it is actually one of the best sort of up-and-coming action writers. So to me, I was just as curious in what he does as anybody else that I talked to. And for me, that was really important, and I've been really happy with some of the response we've gotten already from people who have read the book and just been so happy to see all the different genres. I mean, there's kids' movies and here family films and things like that. And all of them treat their work incredibly seriously. Just because people work in more sort of commercial uh, genres or more mainstream genres, they don't act uh, 
any differently in terms of the seriousness of their work, how they go about their work. And to me, though, that was just incredibly interesting to sort of see how, in their own ways, they approach their work and how they go about doing it. So, yes, when they when it was offered to me to do the screenwriting book, I was uh, – just to get to meet some of these people, I, I, I jumped at the chance. Yeah. Was it I, – I, I believe this was in your book, The um, and maybe it was Mark that said it, um, talking about action screenwriting, that you kind of – as an action screenwriter, you the writer's job is to kind of let their imagination run wild, and it's more the director's job to figure out, okay, that's not within our budget. We can't do that, and, and to, to pare it down in that way. Was right, that, yeah, that that? Was, you're right. That was Mark. Yeah, Mark Bombeck talks about that because when he started, um, he didn't start off as an action writer, and he did thrillers and other genres and things like that. And when he was first sort of a, you know started to work his way into action writing. Uh, there was sort of that worry about, well, how do I know that this is even possible? And I think it was a studio uh, executive at Fox uh, for Live For Your Die Hard who said, don't worry about it, just write it, and we'll figure it out, and the director will figure it out. And uh, you know, there was some kind of freeing, I think, for him to know that you just, like you said, just come up with something really great, really cool, really fun, write that, and then we'll see about making that possible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, cause it's funny because you know, you think about different genres, about sort of you letting your imagination uh, kind of run free. And I think in action movies, sometimes you, because there's so much technical stuff involved, maybe there you would think maybe there isn't as much imagination, but there very much is. Um, so yes, yeah, so, yes. Yeah, so Mark talks about uh, that a little bit, and Mark also talks about you know, when he first came to uh, to Los Angeles, he worked. Um, you know, at an agency, you know, reading scripts and doing coverage and sort of seeing good scripts, bad scripts, and sort of learning the differences between those and what things sold and what things didn't. And, you know, he has a, you know, he he went and got a film school education, but at the same time, kind of learning the practicalities of how the business work were really helpful. And I think things like that are really kind of interesting because you have someone like him that sort of learned in Hollywood, but then you have people like, like Jean Claude Carrier, for instance, and uh, some other writers, David Hare, um, who didn't, who really don't have a lot of dealings um, with Hollywood, and seeing how their background is, and it's so completely different. Um, like, like I said, the, the, book, the book to me is, does not teach people how to become a screenwriter, but I think the thing that is encouraging uh, for young writers if they're reading the book is that there really are just all of these different ways. Um, to write, and the reason why you write um, can be incredibly different. I, I could kind of go, go on and on, but I will say, like for instance, like Stephen Gagan, who was such a treat uh, to meet, and his script for Traffic, I think, is you know won the Oscar for it. I think is tremendous. I think he's a tremendous writer. He talks in the book about how he sort of looked down his nose at screenwriting and and he started and he did some television writing as well and he thought well I'll do this for a little while because I'm going to write fiction and I'm going to you know be a great novelist or something like that and going through the process of learning just how difficult screenwriting is that gave him such respect for the craft and learning from great screenwriters made him realize that he shouldn't be looking down at this art form that it's, that it's incredibly complicated um and just stories like that i think are really interesting because all these people kind of came into the world of of screenwriting in very very different ways and it's sort of amazing to sort of hear some of these stories and how they ended up in screenwriting it's sort of sort of a luck of the draw sometimes with some of these uh, mm -hmm, some of mm -hmm. these people tell me because i i think it just plays a role in any artist's plight when they work in a commercial medium um, and it's particularly true for screenwriters. Artists have to have uh, have to have a certain empathy and sensitivity about them, uh, but they also have to have a thick skin because they're bound to be rejected. Their work is bound to be altered sometimes unrecognizably from their their draft. Right. How do they deal with that? Um, you know, I think that um, I think all of us in America, kind of what walk of life we're in. Um, have to sort of learn to develop that. That's sort of thick skin that you're talking about. And 
uh, some of the people that I talked to um, were really interesting about and revealing and very candid about how they deal with it. I mean, I, I immediately, as soon as you said that, I thought of, uh, of Caroline Thompson, um, who, among other things, wrote Edward Scissorhands. And mm-hmm. she talks about, and I think her voice in these chapters, it's not in a Q&A format. It's just I interviewed them each for about two hours and then took out my questions and let their answers sort of flow into sort of a monologue from them and so that right. so that the reader can really get a sense of their voice. And her voice in her chapter, I think, comes through uh, quite strongly. I'm, I'm really pleased with how that chapter came out because she is one tough lady and she will not put up with much. And she is very clear about, especially as a woman uh, in Hollywood, as a screenwriter, sort of talking about what she's had to uh, to put up with. Um, she is she's very brave and she's very candid. I think in terms of talking about what she's had to put up, what she won't put up with, how she sort of doesn't doesn't suffer fools easily. Um, and I think that that's something like in her case that just from talking to her and, and getting to know her a little bit, I think sort of comes naturally to her. I don't think that she had to develop it. Um, I think about like Guillermo Arriaga, for instance, who's in the book, mm-hmm. and he, and he's very much that same way. From and he talks about it in his chapter about from a pretty early age he would write uh, plays, and if the other people, like the actors in the play, want to make these changes and wouldn't tell him why, he would refuse to let them use his play. And that's from a very early age. And when I would ask him about that, I said, well, you know, weren't you concerned about them not doing your play? I I really think, I mean, he didn't say this, but I think that he would have never even considered the question or that being a possibility because it's his work and he respects it. And if mm-hmm. the other person doesn't respect it, then he doesn't want to work with that person. And, you know, I, I think people like Guillermo and Caroline, I think that they've just come about that naturally. I think for other people, they had to sort of learn as they went along, as they got uh, sort of beat up in the process and watch things get uh, taken away from them and, and them not get like final credit on something or dealing with um, being like a first sort of studio assignment and then meeting the director and the director sort of uh, uh, handing them their hat essentially and, and sort of like reading them the riot act about a script has to have this and it has to have that. And people learn that um, as they go along. I, you know, all I mean, the people who essentially work in the studios who I talked to, like John August and, and some other people, Robin Swicord, you know, they've they've learned as they've gone along. Uh, I, you know, I, they have a toughness to them. And I think that that's something that really comes through in the book, is that you have to have talent and you have to have ideas and all of that and an interest in people and dialogue and characters and all of that. But I think you have to be a survivor. And I think you have to also be willing to uh, no going in, it's not going to be easy. And when I think about some of the people who are in this book, that, that really kind of comes through that they are, they're tough and they're survivors and they've had good years and bad years and kind of slow periods and then they're really hot for a while and it just sort of comes and it goes. I remember, remember with them, um, Robin Swicord, she talked about uh, she she worked on Practical Magic, a movie that you know was not a a huge hit, was not very critically acclaimed. Um, she loved working on the adaptation; it's based on the book, and she loved working on that book. And one of the things that she told me is that you have to sort of learn that um, the process of you writing the script and you enjoying that sometimes that's all you're going to get. Because after you hand over the script, it's just disaster after disaster after disaster. And all of that can be really painful. And so you have to learn to just really enjoy the part that you had a hand in when you wrote the script. And, you know, I think that's how, you know, to answer your question sort of a a roundabout way, I think that's how people develop thick skins and kind of learn to survive in Hollywood. They find the things that they can control and that brings them joy and pleasure and some sort of sense of fulfillment and the things they can't control, they have to let go. And that's, 
you know, and I think that's hard, but I think that they've, the ones who can do it, I think they prosper because they go on to the next thing and they learn to sort of make peace with the things that didn't work in the past. You uh, you mentioned Guillermo, and I, I believe it's his his chapter where he's talking about the writing of Tarantino, uh, Tarantino, yes, um, and the fact that he kind of uh, he's so adept at writing dialogue, um, and it got me to think that uh, you know in, in in filmmaking they they always say it's a visual medium, so don't tell us, show us, right, and yet some of our greatest writers, Tarantino. Uh, Neil LaBute, Aaron Sorkin, uh, they're known for their nonstop rapid-fire dialogue. I mean, their their screenplays could almost be stage plays. Um, it, it, that seems to be a bit of a dichotomy. I mean, they are among our most successful screenwriters. Well, and I think it's true. I think it's funny because, you know, in, uh, in the world of, like, say, cinematography or um, film uh, composing, you know, doing scores, you know, there's the old think about the, the two like scores that you notice in movies are you know the, the two good scores are the ones that you notice and the ones that you don't and the idea being that some scores people love because they're very um they come to the forefront and they just announce themselves and other scores are really beautiful but you don't notice them because they're almost invisible and they sort of work in this really great understated sort of way and i think Screenwriting can be that way too. I mean, some of the people that you mentioned, who I also am big fans of, they are, I think, in that first category that you notice it because, I mean, especially I mean, to use Sorkin as an example, his dialogue tends to announce itself, and you can, I mean, like even like just, you know, like he co-wrote Moneyball with Steve Azalea, and, and there are moments in Moneyball where I think most of us can guess, I think Sorkin wrote that part, because it just, mm-hmm. it has a kind of, like you said, rapid fire sort of, um, sort of dialogue, um, and not that Azalea can't, but Sorkin is such a trademark of his, of his writing style, the, the, the characters have sort of a smart, kind of way of talking to each other and everybody's like everybody in the room is smarter than everybody else in the way it works. And I think with the screenwriting we notice that. And I think when you look at some of our best original screenplay winners, um, you notice that. Um I mean I think of uh like Juno for instance. That's a that's an Oscar winning screenplay. It's it's it has the type of like kind of witty, clever dialogue that, you know, is very quotable, you remember. And it helps, I think, Oscar voters um, remember. I, with the it, with the book, what was interesting, I would talk to some of these um, writers about dialogue and how dialogue works for them or doesn't. And, you know, some of them would talk about the fact that they always just felt like, even when they were kids and just starting off as writers, like Andrews Thomas Jensen, who's worked with Suzanne Beer, uh, several times over the years, Andrews talked about uh, just always having sort of an ear for dialogue since he was a kid, always having a certain amount of confidence. Um, I think he's actually one of the people, he talks about West Wing in terms of it being an influence on him. Sorkin uh, is not one of the interviews, but it's funny how other people would talk about Sorkin in terms of influence or, or inspirations or, or people that they whose work that they also sort of admire. And, you know, like Whit Stillman is in the book, and I talked to, you know, Whit Stillman a little bit about his dialogue because it's such a um, very sort of specific way that his characters talk in his movies. And, of course, he writes and directs his movies, which is sort of an interesting thing as well. And he has sort of control over his scripts where some of the other writers in the book don't. And talking about... um, you know, in the book, uh, for people who remember uh, Last Days of Disco with Stillman's movie, one of the best parts of the whole movie is when they debate uh, Lady and the Tramp. And, you know, did Lady make the right decision in terms of the dog that she fell in love with? And, um, and it's a great scene. And I asked him about where the inspiration for something like that comes. And, and you know, again, to Witt's credit, he was very candid and said, that was during a period of my life where I was really annoyed that women that I liked in my life seemed to be going for the tramps of the world as opposed to like uh, like the loyal dog that was like lady's like best friend basically mm-hmm. and he said so i that that came from a 
from a place of anger of me being annoyed that women I liked didn't seem to prefer me. They preferred like the tramp characters. And so something like that gives, um, gives inspiration to, uh, to a scene. And I think that we look at dialogue, we think about dialogue so much as what we remember sometimes from a script. But one of the things I think also kind of comes through in the book is writers talking about structuring and figuring out and, and more than once the, the, the analogy of screenwriting being akin to problem solving mm. is talked about in the book. And a lot of times it's just simply fixing problems and it tends to be character problems or story problems. And so a lot of the work is simply making things be organic um, you know, like David Webb Peoples, who you know worked on Blade Runner and wrote Unforgiven, and you know, he talks about like one of the toughest things is you know what you want a character to do, and you know it would be the right thing dramatically, and then figuring out a way to make it seem like they would want to do it, which seems so obvious, but you know, if you're writing something, that can be very difficult because they're at point A, and you want them to get to point Z, and figuring out how to get them there. Um, that's sort of, I think, to my mind, sort of the invisible, uh, hard work of a screenwriter where it's yeah. making those things seem natural as if the character wanted to do it because it makes sense. And that's what I mean by, you know, the, the things that we don't notice sometimes. If a movie is really working and if a script's really working, sometimes we don't notice because it just seems like it all is falling together the way it's supposed mm-hmm. to, piece by piece by piece. But that's a lot of work sometimes. It takes you know writers two years to make that seem as effortless for us. Um, to Basically, they do two years of work so that we don't notice any work when we're watching the movie. And I think for me, that is my uh, part of my appreciation of meeting these people and talking to them about what they do is because in some ways, their job is to sweat bullets to make things seem completely natural and completely believable and that's a lot yeah it, it, it all has to it all it all has to feel organic yeah you know you know and you talking about sorkin and his influence i i, I adore moneyball and west wing is pretty much my favorite show ever so one of the great conversations in moneyball it's when brad pitt first meets jonah hill in the office there and and he keeps asking over and over again who are you who are you (laughs) and and it's a beautiful dialogue so after i see moneyball i I put in the complete series of the west wing and i'm having a marathon of west wing that exact conversation is in an episode of west wing uh, almost word for word, minus the character names, uh, which brings up an interesting point because we talk about actors being typecast and forced to repeat themselves. Did any of these writers express uh, their thoughts on on that process as it applies to screenwriting? Well, you know, it, it's it's funny you mention it because I think, um, especially early in some of these writers' careers, I think what they wanted to do was to prove they could do one of everything. They could do a screwball comedy. They could do a thriller. They could do a romantic comedy. They could do a a drama. They could do a period piece so that they could show um, that they had, you know, to use a pitching analogy, that they had, you know, three or four pitches that they could use to get a a guy out. And I think that that sometimes that, that worked really well. Like, you know, uh, John August, who's you know worked with uh, Tim Burton a bit in his career, uh, his first produced screenplay was for Go, which I think is a re- actually a really underrated uh, movie, both yeah. for him and for Doug Liman, who directed it. And when he, he talked about when he started off um, his writing career, his screenwriting career, he was doing a lot of uh, kids' movies. And and he's talked about this many, many times, but he also talked about it with me, about how at the beginning of his career he was the family movie, kids movie, animated movie guy, and he didn't want to just be that. And so he wrote Go. And one of the things that was very appealing about Go for him, as he told me, was because there's all these, there's these different stories. It's not like a linear three-act story. He said the great thing about writing Go is it's essentially you're writing three one acts or three first acts. 
And the first act is the easiest act to write in a movie anyway. So I just got to do that, you know, over and over again. But Go helped his career because it's it's a thriller and it's a comedy and it's an action film and it shows that he can write for women, which is oftentimes when you're working in Hollywood, people want to know, can you write for women? And the the script did all those different things. And, and so it, it, basically any job he tried to get, Go is a great calling card for him because it showed that he could do that. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, being pigeonholed further into your career, um, you know, I think that there's always – they can be both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, I mean, Billy Ray is a writer and a director that I absolutely love. I mean, I think Shattered Glass. One of the nice things about this book project was it gave me an excuse to revisit movies I liked because I was going to talk to the people who wrote them, and so I rewatched Shattered Glass. And I really do think it's one of the most underrated movies of the last 10 years. It's beautifully written. And for people who say that as bad as Hayden Christensen was in the in the Star Wars prequels. If you watch him in in Shattered Glass, I think he's, he's actually brilliant. quite exceptional. He's, he's, oh, yeah. and, and a lot of it is 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 his credit, but I also think um, Billy Ray, who wrote and directed the movie. And you know, I, I talked to Billy Ray for the book, and you know, he talked about that even as advanced in his career as he is, as respected as he is, he was up to do. Um, the remake or the reboot, whatever you want to call it, of The Thin Man that Gore Verbinski and uh, Johnny Depp want to do. And again, you know, he's Billy Ray. He's quite accomplished. Um, but he had to, as he, as he talks about in the book, he had to sell them on that he's funny because a lot of his work is not in the, like, in the comedy vein and they wanted Thin Man to be funny and be sophisticated in sort of a grown-up mm. way in terms of its comedy. And so that was a challenge of, you know, he was able to do it, but even he was using that as an example, like even in his career, you know, you get a reputation and the reputation is good because it gets you certain jobs, but then it precludes you from maybe other projects that Hollywood would not consider you for. And so... There's always, I think, those things, you know, becoming good at one type of genre is a blessing because then you get asked to do other ones and be part of that. But then sometimes people only think of you um, for that type of movie. And so you have to kind of extend yourself or prove that you can do um, sort of other things. So I think sometimes pigeonholing is something that the screenwriters are grateful for because it means they're being thought of. But other times they want to break out of that and they have to kind of reinvent themselves almost. I'm so glad that you mentioned Billy Ray because he is absolutely one of my favorite screenwriters and his chapter in, in your book is is incredible. One of the one of the main points of his conversation that I, I was particularly struck by was when he discussed um Breach, uh his script for Breach, which is another terrific movie. Yeah. Um and and the idea that he he didn't have a problem not answering uh, the whys of the character. You know, why would he? Why would he turn against his own government? And you know, it, it, that didn't concern him so much. And that's something that would absolutely concern studio executives and and a lot of audience members too. That because they want concrete answers. And it reminds me of the great films from the '70s that didn't necessarily feel the urge to. To answer every question, you know, there's uh, life is a bit more gray than that. I, I love that. You know, I, I did too. And I think you know, especially as we get further and further away from Breach's release, it, that movie is, I think, sort of a miracle that that movie ever got made because it came out through a studio and also because it stars Chris Cooper. In, in a separate interview I did for with Chris Cooper when that movie came out, he sort of talked about that that he. You know, that movie came out through uh, Universal, I believe, and he talked about to me that, you know, he told the the, sort of the powers that be, they said, listen, I know I'm not, like, I'm not somebody that brings in big box office, and if you you think there's somebody better, I understand, I sort of know the drill, and they they sort of took a shot with him because they respected him, and they took a shot with Billy Ray because they respected him, and that movie very much has a 70s vibe. I mean, just throughout the book, you talk to these uh, writers about what got them into movies, and 
depending on their age, it would make a difference. But the 70s come up a lot about that being a crucial period of movies that inspired them in a certain way. Like um, like another one of my favorite interviews with uh, Hussein Amini, um, his struggle, and I, I, I love his chapter because you, you feel the struggle on the page as he's talking about it, the struggle of wanting to make those movies that he loved from the 70s in a period where it is extraordinarily difficult to make mm-hmm. those kinds of movies and, and wondering how you can do that. And, you know, I think that that is something that is really interesting because it was true in the cinematography book and it's also true in this book, is that that period of the 70s, which I think we can all tend to maybe get overly romantic about, but nonetheless was such an important period in Hollywood filmmaking and such an important period in terms of inspiring several generations afterwards of these are the types of movies I want to make. And now we are at a point where those people have come of age and are working in the business or wherever they're working in the film industry, and they're now kind of grappling with the fact that that period is gone and it's probably not going to come back and how they are in their individual ways sort of making peace with that. Um, I mean, get back to your initial point, though. I agree that I love Billy Ray's response that he didn't worry about that why and that that wasn't... Again, it's a thing of because we talked about it a little bit of to him. I I know that he must have been he's been asked that a thousand times about breach and why the Chris Cooper character does what he does, but he's just so convinced that it's so unimportant and that the mystery of of some of those things are much more valuable, much more rewarding. Which of course I agree with, but as we both know, that's the first note that you get if you do a test screening. Unfortunately. I'm not sure why he did this. It's hard to sympathize with him because I don't understand him. It's very natural that studios want to spell those things out. And when you get a movie like Breach that actually gets released uh, from a studio, um, it it, it really is sort of a miracle. Um, And I think it'd be pretty hard even now to get that movie made just because it's it's not sort of sexy enough and it's not sort of big enough as far as how studios sort of see what their what their business is now. So I'm, I'm glad you like that chapter because yeah, I, I, the Billy Ray chapter, I thought was just, yeah, he, he's, yeah, he's I, a, I adored a, a, a very smart person. Yeah. And I, I adore his movies. And, and, you know, you're so right that it's a, not the mystery. Maintaining the mystery is a lot more valuable because it, it also allows the film to continue to live in your mind after you've seen it. Uh, and I, I think of something like a, a Dog Day Afternoon, which I think Frank Pearson won, won the Oscar for writing that. Um, and, and he wrote a character that you find out in Pacino's character, you find out a lot about him through the course of the movie. And then when the movie's over, you really do feel like there's so much more about this guy that I don't know, that is a mystery, that is so elusive to me. I think it's one of the great characters. And, and, and when you write a character like that, as Billy Ray did with Breach and Shattered Glass, uh, you need an actor that uh, th- that can kind of g- command the screen in a way that, with a look, he c- he can maintain that mystery. I mean, you you're trying to read Chris Cooper's face during that movie, uh, and he's he's got a great face and he's one of our great actors, but th- y- you can't quite penetrate through that mask he wears. Um, it, which brings up a, another point about uh, screenwriting. Um, I remember years ago reading about Steve McQueen that he would, like he would look at a scene from Bullet, like a long conversation that he was to have with Robert Vaughn or something, and he tore the couple of pages out of the screenplay and he said, "Oh, I can do this with a look," and he did because he was what he was one of those great actors. Uh, to what extent do these screenwriters write specifically for actors and their cadence and what their particular strengths are? This is a really interesting question because it's, it's it's something that I would ask certain writers because if especially if it's if it's a bigger project and you know as the writer you know Tom Cruise is attached to this or Johnny Depp and you know do you do you change your writing at all and you know I'm thinking sort of specific examples but I would say generally that the answers tended to be that 
that would actually help. I didn't know if it would help or hurt the writing process. Does it limit your creativity to, to have one person that you're thinking of? But they would say that it did help because you would think about that person and what are their strengths, and you write to that person's strengths. Um, you know, Jean-Claude Carrier, um, you know, long, long, long career that he's had with Bunuel, and I mean, he's one of the few people who's worked with both Bunuel and Michael Haneke, for crying out loud, and he talked about with, um, um, oh, with the movie was Gerard Depardieu, who, who did the title I'm clearly forgetting, Cyrano de Bergiac. They knew that Depardieu was going to be uh, the star of that movie, and as working on the screenplay, one of the things that was really interesting is that they had Depardieu read, he actually recorded himself uh, reading dialogue and reading like scenes, uh, pre-existing scenes, and what it did is it gave him as the writer the sense of, oh, he's doing the character this way, I don't need that line, or I can give him this line, or I should do this, because it, in some ways, I think kind of across the board what the writers talked about is that the 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 relationship between a writer and an actor i think sometimes because we hear these horror stories um we think that maybe it's somewhat combative combative and i'm sure it is in certain occasions but with the writers i talked to one of the things they they mentioned is that in an ideal situation the actor first of all makes it better but they also tell you what you don't need they they help you go oh i don't need that line that's too much this actor can to the, your point about Steve McQueen, they can do that in a look. That will tell more, and that will tell more uh, rather than I, I can show this, you know, and, and I don't need these lines of dialogue. Their face can express that and express that much more than just the writing. You know, um, David Ayer, uh, David Hare talks about um, Moneyball, going back to Moneyball for a second. And one of the things that he really talks about is how much he appreciates what Zalian and Sorkin did for the screenplay for Moneyball because what they do allows Brad Pitt to just be. I mean, one of the things he talks about, which may sound counterintuitive, is that that's one of the most natural performances yeah. that Brad Pitt has ever given. And it's also one of his best performances. And, and David Harris' point is that because you know, Pitt knows that the screenplay is doing all of the work and all he has to do is just exist in that character and be that. He doesn't have to do too much. The script is sort of doing it. And so in that way, there, you do have that relationship between uh, the writer and the actor, where if the writer looks at the actor and knows what they can do well, and by doing read-throughs and things like that, seeing what's not necessary or what that actor can bring and, and writing to that, you can make the, the, you know, the, the actor can make the writing better, but Conversely, the writer can actually help the actor by giving them this thing that they, they can just do naturally and just yeah. be themselves in that way. And and so in that way, I think you have this really kind of great um, thing about like, what an actor uh, can bring. I mean, it's not always a, a, a perfect relationship, and sometimes a, a movie is, uh, is miscast and doesn't sort of work. Um, but when it does, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I think – the whole film craft series sort of demonstrates this, but I think my book really does, is that this whole idea about the director being the author of the film, and listen, I'm a film critic, so I understand the whole idea of the director being the ultimate boss on a movie, and I believe in it, but you do think when you talk to these other craftspeople, like a screenwriter, just how much this whole thing of a movie, this whole idea what a final product is, how much of that comes from other people kind of mm -hmm. contributing their parts and working together in that way. And that may be a little sort of uh, touchy-feely touchy sort of like kumbaya, but I think in the best movies that is sort of true, that there is kind of this, this meeting of the minds. And even some of the people I talk to for the screenwriting book talk about this. You sort of have to have everybody pulling in the same direction, no matter how great the idea is or whatever. If everybody's pulling in the same direction, you have a much better chance. If people are pulling in different ways, it is so much harder for a film to be great. It has to yeah. have everybody sort of seeing the same thing. 
I agree. Uh, I have one more question for you, and then I'll let you off the hook. I've, I've taken up so much of your time. <laughs> oh sorry. yeah, well, I, I think you've 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 got me on a, a subject. Obviously, I I can go on and on uh, about. So obviously, thank you. obviously, I can too. I, I I love this book and, and, and the topic of the book. Um, the rewriting process. I know that the, the, these writers, a lot of them, know the pain of having their baby snatched from them and rewritten by another author. And, and then again, some of these same writers are hired to do the same. Uh, and, and looked upon in its worst light, it, it seems a little cannibalistic. Um, but uh, what are their views on rewriting another writer's work or vice versa? Well, you know, there there are a couple people in the book who I think – I can't remember if any of them have actually rewritten each other, but they've they've been on maybe possibly the same projects, the Hollywood writers sort of specifically. And, you know, it's interesting to talk. John August probably talked about it, I think, the most uh, candidly and the most at length um, because John August is somebody who pops up in credits occasionally, and sometimes he'll do punch-up work. For people who don't know, punch-up work is sort of like, well, we, the script's pretty much there, but we just need the dialogue to be a little more interesting, or we need this character to be a little more dangerous or sexy or funny, so we're going to bring in someone to punch it up. And John August will do that sometimes. He did some work on the first Iron Man, for instance, but his name is not on the credits. And he talked about it a little bit. Um, with um, He's worked sort of extensively with the uh, Charlie's Angels movies, and he talked about how how that process kind of works, and that what he says is that, you know, if you're going to work in Hollywood as a screenwriter, eventually you, you you learn that you are going to be rewriting other people and that sometimes those people are going to come in to rewrite you. And in the best scenarios, as he described it, you, know, you have a conversation with those people. Uh, you know, if I come in to uh, replace you, for instance, maybe we would have a phone conversation and you would sort of let me know, okay, so... These are the problems with the script right now. This is kind of what they're wanting. And as John August said, that first writer lets the other writer know where the bodies are buried. They let you know sort of what's going on, what's the story behind the making of the film right now, what are the problems, who to deal with, and all that type of stuff. And, you know, I know that sometimes it can probably be a very contentious relationship, especially when it comes to end determining final credits, um, which are arbitrated by the Writers Guild, and determining credits because final credits on a movie uh, determine who gets residuals. And so getting a credit can be very, very important, um, even if a movie is not very good. Um, but anyway, that relationship in the best of scenarios is everybody is a professional. Everybody just knows it happens. Um I do know from outside of the book, which is my own sort of experience, that there are times where if one writer is rewriting another writer and they're friends, you know, one writer will call the other writer and say, listen, I'm coming on this. I just want to let you know and sort of get your blessing on it because, you know, the writers have relationships with the studios and with the creative executives, but they also have relationships with each other in a certain way. And it is a small town in terms of that writing community. And so... I think that while it can be very painful to uh, to be kicked off a project, essentially, I think that everybody starts to learn that it's nothing personal. It's the way it works. And the more sort of open you can be, no matter how painful it might be, how open you can be to that next writer and maybe talking a little bit about the project and what's going on and trying to be as helpful in terms of passing on helpful information so that the other writer knows what he or she is getting into, it seems like that kind of gets, you know, everybody sort of pays it forward um, as far as that goes. Um, now, to, to be fair, of course, I'm talking to writers who probably wanted to sound magnanimous about those types of things. Maybe, you know, in the cold light of day, it's a much more kind of painful process. But I think if you're going to work in Hollywood and be successful in Hollywood, you have to learn that that's, that's what you're signing up for to a certain extent, uh, unless you want to be someone like Guillermo and say, you know, I, I'm not going to be re rewritten and you're either going to take the script or not take the script. You can take that path if you want to, and that has its own rewards and its own kind of um, dangers. But, 
Guillermo is sort of a uh, a one in a million, I feel like. And you look at the movies that he's written and that he's made, and he is sort of one in a million. And he's you know he's worked mm-hmm. with uh, you know great filmmakers and and written great scripts. And so the way he is about sort of my way or the highway. I'd say the work sort of justifies uh, his 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 attitude about his own work. So. Yeah, well, and I love his uh, I love his burning plane. That 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 was Guillermo's, right? The burning yes, plane. Yes, he, he wrote and directed that. Yeah, yeah, he and and he that. talks he talks about uh, writing a completely unsympathetic character with Charlize Theron and 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 making the audience sympathize with her by the end of it. That was the very special challenge with that. I think. Yeah, and I'm glad you you brought it up because I also love that in the chapter. Is it because then you know with, with um, you know whether it's Morris Peros or Babel um, or Twenty One Grams, he loves. And he talks about this in the book. He loves writing characters, like you said, who he almost like perversely and willfully will force you to understand, even if you don't like them. I mean, I, talking to him, I just got that sense that he enjoys this idea that, we, that characters have to be likable, and he likes sort of screwing with that idea and and making it work. It seems like it's something that he just believes very strongly in that that whole idea that characters have to be likable and sympathetic he just resists that and wants to prove that wrong and so his some of his writing um is very much about like you said the charlie theron character you know you are not going to like this person but i'm going to make you understand who they are and, mm-hmm. and he like as he's shown time and time again he just you know and uh and three burials that he wrote which i absolutely love oh, this is the same thing in there too i mean you know and it's for example, I, 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 you know, of, of a character that might be difficult uh, to understand or love, but also like Tommy Lee Jones wanting to make that his directorial debut and him star in it, you know. And uh, I think he got uh, Best Actor, speaking of, of the Cannes Film Festival, getting Best Actor uh, for that. I mean, it's one of his very best performances, and it's you know, it's him knowing that that script is good and knowing exactly. Um, what to bring to? I mean, he just brings his, for lack of a better way of describing it, his Tommy Lee Jones ness yeah. to that role. And it, you know, in terms of, of of Guillermo's great scripts, I think that's the one that's really that's, that isn't given enough attention because I think it's such a beautiful movie and it's beautifully made. And Tommy Lee Jones did such a great job with it. 